stories that he told us when we were younger and of the adventures that he experienced during the war. Mimi spent the most time with him when he came to La Libela. She would be speechless and her eyes would light up when listening to his stories. In a way, it was my father and his stories that provoked my desire to become a monk. He did not want to be a soldier. My father knew thousands of stories, and in reality, what he really wanted to be was a jongleur, a minstrel traveling from festival to festival, telling his stories. He told us that one of our ancestors was a jongleur of the king, and he accompanied him on military campaigns as well as his spiritual retreats. That king, it seems, was a very devout man who had churches built like this one. The king regarded him so highly that he granted him the position so that his descendants could inherit it. This is how it was until my great-grandfather stopped playing and took up arms since he was the griot of Menelik II. My father died in the war as a soldier, but in reality, he was a jongleur, a man who loved life. As a monk, I feel close to my father, close to the life that he would have liked to have lived, a life of searching, dedicated to God and the souls of all men. At the monastery, we spend a lot of our time meditating or reciting verses from sacred books. Sacred books are written in Ge'ez, the predecessor of Amharic, the language that is spoken throughout the country today. Ge'ez is a kind of Ethiopian Latin, and its first inscriptions date back to the first century of our time. The first Bible was translated into Greek, but it was not until the 13th and 14th centuries when the golden age of literature of the Ge'ez language flourished. Many books were translated into Arabic, producing new writings that would later become the sacred books of Ethiopian Orthodoxy. Among these books you will find the Kebra Negast, whose author is unknown, and one which praises the glory of the kings. It is the great national epic poem. There is also a sophisticated collection of legends, which highlights the story about the Queen of Sheba, Solomon, and the Ark of the Covenant. In these and other legends, starting with the biblical characters, the Ethiopian writers have contributed to the myth in order to adapt to the desires of the Ethiopian kings, who wanted to be direct descendants of the kings of Israel. At the Ethiopian monasteries, whether a monk or not, a traveler will always receive a piece of iñera and a glass of water. Yigeno's journey continues, and there is a long stretch that remains before he reaches Addis Abeba. On their way to Addis Abeba, Mimi and Yigeno approach one of the greatest natural wonders of Ethiopia, the Tisisat waterfalls. 
Pedro Paez and James Bruce, as well as the first Portuguese who saw these waterfalls, described them with such astonishment as someone confronting a supernatural landscape. They fall over a stretch 400 meters wide and plunge 50 meters down. Smoke of the Nile is what the natives call this place, a poetic name and one profoundly close to reality. Because smoke is what the millions of minuscule particles of mist rising over the crest of the mountain appear to be. Mist that has created a perennial microclimate jungle around the falls. Only the Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River can compare in beauty and majesty. Addis Abeba is like one of those African capitals created to confuse the visitor. It's noisy, frenetic, dilapidated, but it also possesses an internal rhythm that invites you to stop, one that does not drive you out with dusty threats. The city possesses an invisible order that is difficult to decipher. It's a city of mixed cultures, sitting at the foot of the mountains and overflowing with churches, markets, and fantastic tree-lined streets. More than just a city, Addis Abeba is a meeting point, the beginning and the end of all journeys. The festival that Gijeno and Mimi want to attend has already begun. It's the Mascal Festival, just one more among the numerous excuses that Ethiopians use to continue renewing the myth each year. It's the everyday celebration of life and death, like the two faces of one moon. Mascal is a festival that celebrates the rediscovery of Jesus Christ's cross every year. It tells about the legend that was spread in the year 326 when Empress Helena, mother of Emperor Constantine of the Roman Empire, found the wooden cross, the cross that was used to crucify Christ. The Empress had converted to Christianity in secrecy long before her son. This is why she is not only considered a saint under Christianity, but also the patron and protector of the Order of the Knights of the Temple, the Templars. One of their most important missions during the Middle Ages was to protect the Holy Cross. The objective of the Empress, however, was to find the location of the Holy Sepulchre. According to legend, she was unable to find it on her own which is why she prayed to the smoke of an incense bonfire, which led her to the location of the cross. At the height of the division of the Coptic and Orthodox churches during the Middle Ages, 
the Patriarch of Alexandria gave half of the cross to the Ethiopian Emperor Dawit. According to the stories, the idea of St. Helena was to take the cross to the Christian kingdom closest to Jerusalem in order to keep it away from the battles of the Crusaders. Since then, one half, the crossbeam, remains under the protection of the Coptic Christians in the monastery of Santa Maria, 70 kilometers from the city of Dezi. During the festival, the people decorate the streets and homes with flowers, mostly yellow daisies. The celebration ends with the burning of a great pyre of aromatic flowers that represents the renewal of time. Because in Africa, in the eternal Africa of myths, death does not exist. Death is nothing more than an invention by man which renews time in order to continue seeking out life. Yeah, 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 yeah.